Shalom, Israel. Welcome to King James Bible University, San Antonio. And my name is Elder Fields. We're going to move into today's teaching. Talking about a big mouth. I can remember songs when hip hop, some hip hop songs. I'm dating myself back in the 80s. Houdini. She got a big mouth. Some of y'all might be familiar with that song. Or Run DMC. You talk too much. <laughs> All right. So the big mouth. The deadly undisciplined tongue is a problem in Israel and it's causing many problems and it will continue to cause problems until we put this flesh down and take up our cross, our suffering under death and keep disciplining ourselves and follow Christ. So we're going to talk about this today. I pray that you be blessed. I will say get your pens and paper out, take take notes, write down the precepts and uh, may you be blessed and let's get started. All right, Israel. On this slide, we see a, a, a principle here that says when God speaks. So we understand that everything was created by the word of God. And so I want to kind of show you something here, and then we're going to move on with this study today. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So how did God create the heaven and the earth when he began to move his creative move? He created it by the word of God. All right. How did he do it? He spoke. Okay. So we're going to talk about words. All right. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So God spoke. And so he said, and so when he spoke light, light appeared. Light showed up. Truth came. When he said truth, truth showed up. Okay. Now, Hebrews 11, 3. Through faith, we, the people of the book, understand through by our faith of believing what we're hearing through the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of God. Through faith, we understand through these precepts that the worlds were framed by the word of God, not by men, not by a big bang, not by some metamorphosis, but all these things were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. All right. We're talking about the power of words. Life and death are in words. If God speaks life, you'll live. If God sends the word of death upon you, you're going to die. All right. No if and a but. You can't go past what God is saying. All right. Isaiah 55 and 11. It says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. This is what thus saith the Lord. The spirit of God is saying unto Israel. So shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing wherein I sent it. So whatever word God sends on the path is going to accomplish what he sent it to accomplish. If it's to redeem, it's going to redeem. If it's to destroy, there's going to be destruction. Whatever God says is and will be. So we have to get accustomed to bringing ourselves into alignment with the truth and the righteousness of God's word that the wrath of God will not fall upon us. And so that's why we got to bring ourselves to understand what we got to do about an undisciplined mouth. In a tongue that's full of trouble. You've heard it said. As a child. Sticks and stones may break my bones. But words will never hurt me. Now my question to you my brother my sister. Is that statement a fact or fiction? Is that statement a fact or fiction? We were singing that all the time. And saying that as kids. And remember when you get hit with a stick or a stone. It hurts. But that, that hurt is only temporal. It only hurts for a short period of time, but words create lasting wounds and sometimes eternal wounds. All right. Remember, words have caused lives to be lost, relationships to be ended and souls to be destroyed. All right. Let's pick up in Sirach 37 verse 18. For a manner of things appear, for a manner of things appear, good and evil, life and death, but the tongue ruleth over them continually. So the tongue or the mouth and the words that proceed out of our mouth will rule over good and evil pertaining to us or life or death pertaining to us. So we got to pay attention to what is coming out of our mouth. All right. That comes from Sirach out of the Apocrypha, Sirach or Ecclesiasticus 37, 18. And Brother Peter speaks of us and he says to us in 1 Peter 3, 10, for he that will love life and see good days if that's what you want, let him refrain his tongue from evil 
and his lips from speaking no guile. So if we want life, we got to move our tongue and our heart to that area and stay there. If we want righteousness, we got to move and stay there. All right. So if you love life and you want to see good days, it's paramount that you and I, we learn to refrain our tongue from evil and our lips that they speak no wickedness. And I encourage you, stick with this teaching and we shall proceed. Shalom, my brothers and sisters. Once again, uh, we're dealing with this slide. You know, we got big, big problems. Israel has a big problem. And we can see this problem manifesting itself in all types of ways. And that's one of the main reasons why I was led to do this and I felt to do this teaching is because we have way too many young men and young women being put to death in this society. And I'm talking about our, our people killing one another. And a lot of it is based on what I'm about to hit to now. And so we got real big problems. And that big problem is the mouth and the heart. James 3 and 3, it says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Remember also the ships, though they were very, though they be so great. Like take, for instance, a, a, a aircraft carrier. I think it's humongous. All right. And are driven of force wind of fierce winds. Yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. So wheresoever that pilot turns that helm that in that transfers the turn of that little wheel that helm transfers power to turn that rudder which is small compared to the size of the ship and that big ship is able to be steered through the fierce winds of the sea all because of that small helm where that captain or that uh, pilot of the ship is up working and a 2,000 pound animal called a horse that has to be broken. Once he's broken, the rider puts a bit in his mouth and through the bit being in the mouth of the horse, the rider can control the horse to do whatever the rider wants the horse to do. Now, this uh, similitude is compared to the tongue in the mouth of Israel and in the mouth of the people of God and in our mouths. It says, even so, the tongue is a little member so that little piece of flesh that's in our mouth that helps us to speak, help us to eat food, that little member is tied to our heart. And that's where the problem lies. And so it says, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. Remember how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So that little tongue can boast in great things and create havoc and create fires and create danger and death and destruction. Also, uh, looking at the tongue, we're in James 3, 6, and it says, and the tongue is a fire. Now, there's another thing that's a fire. The Bible tells us that our God, the God of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, is a consuming fire. We must respect, we must reverence him, because he has the power to not only destroy the body, but also the soul, all right? But the tongue of man is also a fire. It has the power to kill or make alive. It is a fire. It is a world of iniquity, a world of sin, a world of evil deeds. It says, so is the tongue among our members. Now, remember, Paul is, I mean, James is talking to Israel. Remember, he wrote to the 12 tribes that are scattered in the diaspora. So James 3 and six is telling us that the mouth and the tongue among Israel is creating a world of iniquity. It's creating uh, fires and deaths and destruction. It is defiling all of Israel and it sets Israel on fire the course of the nature of hell. Let me read this again. James three and six. The tongue is a little fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. So is the tongue among the Israelites that it defileth the whole body. So the Hebrew tongue is defiling the whole Hebrew body and set it on fire the course of nature. What is that nature? The flesh. 
The Hebrew tongue is setting on fire the flesh in the lives of Hebrew people. And that flesh is setting Hebrew people on the course for destruction called hell. And it says it's set on the fire of hell. And so that little member is causing so much havoc. If you just look at how we're living as a people as a whole in, in any city and the things that are, our people are involved in. It's, it's, it's sad and that's why I'm making this video. Also, James tells us in James 3, 8, that the tongue can no man tame. You cannot tame the tongue. That's why, like the rest of the flesh, it has to be put to death. And then once it's dead, it can be controlled by the spirit of truth. No man can tame the tongue. Or excuse me, but the tongue can no man tame. We can tame beasts. We can tame animals. We can tame horses. A man can tame a... a, a sort of tame a, a killer whale to leap out of the water on his command, but a man can't tame his own mouth. A man can tame, his, tame a lion to do certain things in the circus to a certain extent, can domesticate a dog or a cat, but the man cannot tame his own mouth. He says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. We must understand that our mouths, our tongues are unruly evils. They are rebellious they're tied to a rebellious nature called the heart and our tongue and our mouth is full of deadly poison and that's why we have on a daily basis young men and young women among the hebrew people in america and in other parts of the world being put to death in the streets beefing on youtube beefing on uh instagram beefing on ig beefing on twitter about some stupid hip-hop whatever Boasting about how much money you got, how much this you got, boasting how many bodies you got, boasting on body counts, even though most of them probably haven't killed anybody. And why would we boast on killing somebody? I believe once you kill a man, your soul, man, it's a grievous thing for the spirit. All right. But we got all these guys boasting, all these women boasting how raunchy they can be, how how filthy they can be. We got we got waps and all this nasty stuff that comes out of the mouth of Hebrew men and women. And we're living like beasts. And because our heart is evil, this unruly tongue is pushing out this death. And many are getting paid millions and millions of dollars on this death to put us to death. And our children are eating it up and they're dying like dogs in the street. And so it really moves me to put this subject out here about our problem is this big mouth we got. This unruly member we got. This evil spirit we got and heart we got. And so it reminds me that a, a few months, uh, early in about a month ago, a young man was shot dead in, in uh, Dallas, Texas. I don't follow these hip hop guys, these modern guys, but some young 28 uh, year old rap artist called Mo3. He was gunned down in broad daylight, shot up in his car, got out of his car, tried to run. A man got out of a car, and this is all on film, ran up behind him and shot him clear in the back of his head, put him to death. Now, if you go back and probably listen to some of the things that him and other these these other hip hop dudes in, in that particular city were saying against each other, there was a whole lot of beefing and boasting and foul mouth talking online and on Instagram and on records and in 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 you know all over the place. And because of all that Twitter beef, this man is dead. And every day, hundreds die because of this little member. And that's why we're making this video. And uh, it's terrible and it's wicked and no man can tame it. So we got to find out why is it terrible and what we must do. But when we sit here and we look at man and his nature, <coughs> excuse me, we have to deal with the nature of man. The Bible tells us in Job 14, 1 and 2. That man is born of a woman a few days and he's full of trouble. Now we got to understand that that word man means male and female. All right. It not speaks simply talking about a woman. When the Bible refers to men only, it says men. When it says man, it refers to mankind, male and female. So a man is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Why is that trouble? Because of his nature. Okay, we're going to get into that. 
He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. So our lives are short in this world and we, are, we die daily in this flesh. And we're put to death and we evaporate. So 100 years is nothing to live or 60 years or 50 years. And so that's how man is. Man's life is full of trouble because our hearts are full of trouble because we're laden with sin. Now, speaking of the Hebrew man, God says to Israel in Isaiah chapter one, verse three and verse four, the ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib. All right. So the dumb animal, the ox knows who he belongs to and the dumb ass, that stubborn beast, he knows where he lives. But Israel, whom God is comparing us to a dumb ox and a dumb ass, don't know. My people do not consider. Then he goes on to describe Israel. He says, a sinful nation. We are a sinful nation. That's why we are, we are trapping and we're caught up out here doing all kind of wicked things. That's why we see the things that are perpetuated among our young people and among our old people and among us as a nation of people. Uh, a sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, laden with sinful, wicked works, a seed of evildoers. Instead of following the covenant of our father, the most high God of Israel, we have found following Gentiles and we're found following our own carnal nature. And so instead of being uh, seeds of righteousness, we have become and we're born into this world seeds of evildoers. He says the children that are corruptors. So when you go and you look at many corrupt things and corrupt lifestyles, you're going to find Israel at the top. All right. Children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the spirit of God. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. And so Isaiah is telling us the condition of our Israelite or our Hebrew minds and our hearts. We're born but a few days and we're full of trouble. Why? Because we've gone away from our God. We've gone all the way backwards. We have not walked in the covenant that he's given us. And therefore, sin has beat us down. All right. Proverbs 28 and 5. It says, evil men understand not judgment. So evil men do not understand the doctrine and teaching of the Most High. Evil men, because men are evil, they cannot understand the scriptures. And so that's why you got a whole lot of people trapped. Our people trapped in these churches, trapped in Christianity, because our nature is evil. And Christianity gives us an easy way out. But at the same time, it doesn't put us in the right place with God because there's no understanding of the, of, the, of the precepts and the principles of God. So evil men understand not the doctrine and teachings of the Most High, but they that seek the Spirit of God shall understand all things. And so with an understanding heart and mind, we got to seek the truth and turn our evil heart back unto God. So we have to understand that man at his core is wicked. Okay? Now, Concerning the heart of man, let's take a look at Sirach 3, 26 and 27. It says, a stubborn heart shall fare evil at the last. So a stubborn heart, a rebellious heart, a heart that rejects the truth, rejects the way of the Most High God, that, that is full of itself, full of pride and full of iniquity, full of sin, that heart is going to get paid death, all right, at the last Payment is going to be death, and that death is the second death. Everything in this flesh is going to die naturally. We're talking about that eternal fire and condemnation. All right? A stubborn heart shall fare evil at the last, and he that loveth danger shall perish therein. And so we got to fall out of love with this madness, and that's what's propelling me right now. We got so many of our young people in love with this foolish madness, this thuggish, wicked, evil, sinful, prideful, carnal, wicked ways. And they're dying. I just saw a video and I sent it to one of the brothers of a 12-year-old that just got sentenced to seven years in prison for, for shooting a one-year-old child with a gun. And this 12-year-old, when he was 11, wants to be a thug. He was supposed to be a rapper. He's doing all kind of wicked, evil things. And you wonder, where's his mom and his daddy? But but we're, we, we are evil seeds. We are corruptors, all right? So now, let's go back to Sirach 3.27. It says, an obstinate heart or a hard heart shall be laden with sorrows. 
The reason many of our people are living in sorrow and shame and anguish and frustration is because our heart is hard. We have to break open the fallow ground. We have to bust that hard heart open, that, that carnal heart that has to be broken. All right. A hard heart shall be laden with sorrows and the wicked man shall heap sin upon sin. So we keep going from sin to sin to sin to sin. Everything we do is from one stage of sin going deeper into the next stage. All right. You can look at the entertainment industry. You can look at the music industry. Sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. All right. Now. Uh, what does the prophet Hosea have to say to us, Israel, about the character and root of men of Israel? He says, my people, Israel, are bent to backsliding from me. This is what the Most High said about us through the prophet Hosea. He says, my people, who are his people? Israel, my people, these Hebrews are bent to backslide from me. Though they called them to the Most High, none all at all would exalt him. So though God sent the prophets to cause Israel to come back to the covenant and back to the promise. And though we have voices online like uh, King James Bible University teaching precepts in the precept mastery. And though these voices out here calling Israel back to the covenant, we are hell bent on going into destruction. So though they called him to the most high, though the prophets were sent and the word came forth with power, none of Israel would exalt the most high. Why? We're stuck in this trap with this flesh. All right. And what did Israel do? Hosea 10, 13. Yea, or ye have plowed wickedness. So instead of living in the right path of righteousness, because we follow the flesh and no flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom of God and all flesh is sin and corruption before God. It says ye have plowed wickedness. Ye have reaped iniquity. So if we plow a field to plant corn, and you plow up the field and you plant the corn seed, what's coming up? Corn. So if we plow in our lives wickedness through what we think and what we speak and what we say and what we feed our mind and our spirit, don't you think iniquity won't be reaped in the end? So Israel has plowed wickedness, rebelling against the most high, fleshly carnal things, uh, even in these religious systems called churches. It's all flesh and it's wickedness before the most high. He's not receiving your gospel music. Kurt Franklin or whoever you may be, God's not receiving those songs. He says, I hate that stuff. And you can find that in the book of Amos. All right. Ye have plowed wickedness and ye have reaped iniquity. All right. And that's what we've done. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies. We have inherited lie upon lie upon lie. So all these prophets are lying. These pastors are lying. These systems are lying. These Gentile systems are lying. So instead of producing quality people, we're producing thoughts and we're producing uh, effeminate men and we're producing all kind of low life people when we should be the top quality on the planet because we're rebellious and stiff necked. He says, ye have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way. Because we trust this flesh, my brother, my sister, Hebrew man, black man, black woman, that's why we in a mess. Because thou didst trust in thy way. What is the way? Thy way he's talking about the flesh and in the multitude of thy mighty men because we trust the mouth of all these big shots, these big shot preachers, these big shot artists, these big shot musicians, film directors, big shots on the job, everybody talking big, but they're far from God. And because we trust in these fools, we are on our way to destruction. And that's the ruling character of man, evil to the core, full of trouble from birth all right don't consider who we are don't consider the covenant don't consider the scriptures and once we start considering the scriptures every day we got to battle this tongue and battle this flesh to make sure we kill it that we can inherit eternal life getting heaven is not going to be easy and there's many of us and many young people they will i'm trying to pray listen God ain't hearing our prayers if we live in wickedly. We got to crucify this flesh. And that's why I'm dealing with this member called the tongue today. And so I know I'm getting kind of fired up right here, but I got to go on. So bear with me, Israel. Tongue, this little wicked member, this evil member, full of deadly poison. All right. Full of a fire, setting on fire, killing relationships, killing women, killing husbands, killing wives, killing children, killing their their heart, killing their mind so, so they end up 
at the bottom of society. That's what's in us. Venom in our mouths. That's why I got these pictures on here. Let's hear what Proverbs says to us about the mouth. All right, Proverbs 8, 20 and 21. It says, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. So whatever your mouth is producing, your life is going to produce. And, and so a man's lust shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. And so if my lips are full of wickedness and full of evil and full of lust, my life is going to be full of that stuff. Okay, Proverbs 8, 21. This is a powerful precept. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it, death and life, shall eat the fruit thereof. Now you wonder, why is death first? Why is death first? You ever wonder why? He didn't say life and death is in the power of the tongue. And many preachers, they'll misquote this and say, life and death is in the power of the tongue. This is not what it says. It says death and life. Why is death first? Why? Because the tongue is unruly. It is connected to an evil heart that we're going to see. And so the first thing the tongue produces until the flesh is put to death is death. Life never comes out of this tongue. Life, true life, eternal life, righteousness cannot come out of our mouths as long as our heart and our mouth is tied to sin. So death not only physical, but the second death is in the mouth. And eternal life is in the mouth. And we got to choose which, which one do we want in order to have eternal life in our mouth and in our heart. We're going to have to kill this flesh. We're going to have to kill something. We're going to have to kill ourselves. We're going to have to kill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And all these things are set on fire by the mouth. All right, here we are. We're going to deal with the heart because remember, the heart and the mouth are connected. There is a connection that God put in place and you can't get around it. All right. We are born with an evil heart. Remember, from our youth, we're going to find out that our hearts have been evil. All right. So we're going to deal with evil hearts and brute beasts. Genesis chapter six, verse five. Let us hear the word of the Lord. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Where was man's wickedness great? In the earth. Where is man's wickedness great now? In the earth. Where, why? Because man is in the earth. Man is wicked. All right. God saw that the wickedness of man, male and female, was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So when God looked down upon his creation and he looked at man, he looked at the first Adam. And he looked at us, and as he's looking at us now, he sees the wickedness of humanity, of Israel, of man. And he understands that every, listen, this is a powerful thing. Every thought of the heart, every imagination of the mind, everything that man desires within himself is only evil continually. Desiring that big house can be evil continually if the lust to get the big house means you're going to do crime, evil, and do wickedness to get it. That's why the love of money is the root of all evil. Because what's motivating the, the Bentley? Is it pride? Is it arrogance? Is it wanting to be known? All those things are evil, and we're going to find that out. And so the tongue is going to back up what's in the heart, and that's what we got to understand. So man from the beginning... His thoughts and imaginations of his heart was only evil continually. All right, let's pick up in Genesis 8:21. And the Spirit of God smelled a sweet savor. And the Spirit of God said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for that male and female. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Okay, so... Uh, I can stop right there. You can read the rest of the verses. It says, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I've done. But the key part I want to pick out in Genesis 8, 21 is that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So when God looks at us, 
from the day we crack the womb and we cry when we take our first breath of air outside of the womb of our mothers to the day we go down into the earth unless we are transformed and renewed and born again from above and we live the life that God is calling us to live through the truth. If we don't do that, we just live a natural life. From the day we live to the day we die in this flesh, we are evil continually from our youth. That's what God is saying. Your mama may not like it. You may not like it. I may not like it, but it's the truth. And we have to understand I and you are evil from our youth from the jump. That's why you don't have to teach a child to do right. It's in him to do wickedness. Why? Because we're evil from the beginning. And it's all a heart problem. We're not talking about that thing that beats and pumps blood in your body. That physical muscle. We're talking about your soul and your spirit. That inner part of you that makes you who you are. That where your desires live. Where the seat of your affections and your emotions live. All right. It says the heart is deceitful above all things. Oh, my brother, God knows my heart. Have you heard that? People be trying to testify in these churches and we used to say some of the most dumbest things. But man, you know, God knows my heart. Nigga out here living like a devil. But God knows my heart. Yeah, you know what you're saying? He knows your heart. He knows my heart. Our heart is wicked and evil. And our heart going to get us destroyed. Your heart is not something to be trusted. You can't trust yourself. God don't trust no flesh. He don't trust us at all. He only trusts his truth, his word. He trusts the spirit of Christ. He don't trust us. So the heart of man is deceitful above all things. The most deceitful thing on the planet, the scriptures tell us right now in Jeremiah 17, is your heart and my heart. And, it's a, and it is de desperately wicked. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know this heart? That's why David asked the Lord to try him, examine him, purge him, cleanse him, wash him, make him clean. That's the same thing we must ask on a daily basis. Father, help us to do so. All right. Our heart is wicked. It's evil. Desperately wicked. It lusts. It lives for wickedness. And your level of wickedness and my level of wickedness as a man, we can see some people like Hitler. Oh, he's wicked. Listen. Just to live a natural life in this life, you don't have to be a Hitler, but just be a natural man from the core. We're just as wicked. We've never killed nobody in the flesh, but just from the core, we just as wicked because we probably murdered somebody in our thoughts. Or in our heart. In our mind. We're wicked. This is what the Bible says. There ain't nothing good in man. Alright. Second answer was 3, 19 and 20. Thy glory went through four gates. Of fire and of earthquake and of wind and of cold. That thou mightest give the law unto the seed of Jacob. And diligence unto the generation of Israel. So God gave law to the seed of Jacob. Now, God told us in uh, Isaiah 1, 4, that the seed of Jacob is a seed of evildoers. My goodness, because <laughs> of this flesh. But now, praise the Most High. God gave us a law to the seed of Jacob that we might come out of this state we're in, that we're born into. And diligence unto the generation of Israel. So every generation that Israel is reproduced on the earth we have to become diligent. But even though he gave that to us, it's been robbed from us and taken from us. And now it's being reintroduced back to us. Why? Verse 20. Because when God gave Jacob and gave Israel the law, he didn't remove our natural heart from us. He says, and yet tookest thou not away from them, from Israel, a wicked heart. That thy law may bring forth fruit in them. So in order for the law. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy soul. And all thy mind and thy strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. In order for the law. And the commandments to bring forth fruit in us. Fruit unto righteousness. Fruit unto eternal life. The wicked heart has to be put to death. And that's something only we can do. As we submit ourselves to Christ. 
So he didn't take a wicked heart away from us. He left it there and he gave us a law. That the law may bring forth fruit. So the truth has, we have to conquer this wicked heart with the truth. Second Ezra 3.21 For the first Adam, bearing a wicked heart, before Adam sinned, by learning the way of the devil, the Bible tells us he was naked, he was in sin, and he was not ashamed. He was already a sinner, but he had God covering him and protecting him. But when he transgressed the covenant of God, the spirit of Christ bounced from him, and Adam transgressed, male and female, bearing a wicked heart. So how could the devil get him in Eden, in paradise? Because our heart was wicked from the beginning and was overcome. And so be all they that are born of him. So everybody that comes from Adam, including you, Hebrew, and me, Hebrew, we have that same wicked heart and we transgress. It says, thus infirmity was made permanent and the law in the heart of the people with the malignity of, a, of the root so that the good departed away and the evil abode still. So because of the infirmity, the weakness and the sin in the flesh, and you can learn about that in Romans 6, 19, because of that permanent carnal state that we're in, The law was in the heart of the people of God with a malignant root like cancer. So the spirit of Christ bounced when Adam sinned and evil abode. And that's our condition. We living in sin, the spirit of Christ is going to bounce. And we living in this flesh, we're in an evil abode. And so instead of living under the law of God, we're now bound under the law of sin and death. All because of the heart and the mouth and the will to rebel against the truth. We're still examining this heart condition. The book of Luke 645 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. That good man is a man that keeps the covenant and follows the commandments of Christ. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. This is where the heart and the mouth connects. God is going to show us something here. For, for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So in other words... What's coming out of your mouth, Hebrew, what's coming out of your mouth, my brother, my sister, what's coming out of my mouth on a continual basis, it's going to either set us up for life or it's going to set us up for death, okay? Because the mouth speaks where the heart is living. So when you hear the words of a person, you can know exactly what street they live on, what they're caught up in, because their mouth is going to reveal it. For of the abundance of the heart. So if sin is abundantly in the heart, the mouth is abundantly in sin. If salvation is working in the heart, salvation will be working in the lips. And we have to keep putting to death our will. And here's another reason why. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if your treasure's in the flesh, in the world, in carnality, that's where your heart is, that's where your mouth is, that's where your life is, that's where your attitude is, that's where your mindset is. If our heart and our treasure is in Christ, then that's where our mouth will be, our mind will be, our attitude will be, and it's a journey. We have to keep fighting to stay on that course. It's a narrow road. The path is narrow, is straight, straight as a gate, narrow as a way that leadeth to life. And few be there that find it. All right? We're examining the evil heart. So wherever the treasure is, 
Where the great desire is, that's where the heart is. Let's move on. Matthew 15, 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth, so whatever is coming out of the mouth, come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. See, this, this, the scribes was, and the, and, and the disciples was having issues, and they was asking Christ about, does eating certain things defile a man? All right? So does eating pork defile a man? Does eating pork defile you? In all essence, no, because you're already defiled if you're eating pork. It is the desire to eat the pork, to break the commandment of God, to live in sin that defiles you. The eating is just a fruit of what's already in the heart. All right? So those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. So we shouldn't eat pork because it should be our desire to please the Most High who called us. We shouldn't eat shrimp. We shouldn't eat unclean things. We shouldn't speak foul because it should be our desire to please him who called us. And we got to fight this war against this flesh that we may live the way he wants us to live. And it's a battle. It ain't going to be easy. Verse 19 of Matthew 15. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts. So the heart is where you're thinking your mind and your spirit. So out of the heart proceed of evil thoughts, murder. So before a man is murdered physically, somebody got to murder him in their mind. Then they'll go kill him. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses or lies, blasphemies. Verse 20. These are the things that defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. You might forget to wash your hands. And pick up an apple and eat it. That's not defiling you. But if you're caught living in these lusts, it is these lusts, these infirmities in the flesh that defile us. And our mouth will be in alignment with our spirit. And that's why we got to battle against this evil heart. All right, let's move on. Baruch chapter 1 verse 22. But every man followeth the imagination of his own wicked heart to serve strange gods and to do evil in the sight of of the Lord our God. So every Hebrew man. Baruch is telling us. Israel. Is bound in this sin. Because of the imagination of our wicked hearts. And therefore we serve strange gods. Just like. God told us. Through Moses in Deuteronomy. You don't want to serve me. I said before you life and death. A blessing and a curse. You reject me. Then you're going to be found serving gods of wood and gods of stone whom your fathers didn't serve. These strange gods. You're going to be found in these religions, Islam and Christianity and all other kind of madness. Feminism and, and uh, SYSBM and all this crazy stuff. All right. All because our heart is wicked. And we was in this. And therefore we did evil in the sight of the Lord our God. And that's why we're in this captivity right now. Let's keep moving on about the heart. All right, because we're going to do what we, we got to link the heart to the mouth. All right, Deuteronomy 134. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear saying. I'm just pulling that phrase. The Lord heard the voice of your words and was angry. So please believe what the scripture says. The scripture says, every idle word that a man speak, he has to give an account for. God is hearing and examining everything that proceeded from our heart through our mouth. He's listening. He wants to see if it's of him or if it's of the flesh and then of the devil. If it's of the devil, we're going to reap what the devil is going to reap. If it's of Christ, then we'll reap what Christ is reaping. Is either salvation or is eternal damnation. All right. And we're going to take a look at how God heard something. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 2. This in this situation, we have three Israelite people, very prominent people. They're all related. We have Moses, Aaron, Miriam. Moses is the prophet of God. Aaron is his minister. And Miriam is his sister and their brother. Aaron is also their brother. 
They were angry because Moses had married a woman that they didn't approve of. And in their ignorance, they didn't realize that the woman was of Abraham's seed because she was of Midian. So they thought he married a heathen and they were going off. And because they was going off, they said some wicked things. And so we're, here we are in Numbers 12 too. And they said, have the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken by us? And the Bible says, and the Spirit of God heard it. So they're putting themselves on Moses' level. And because they're mad because Moses married a woman that they didn't understand was of Abraham's seed. They thought he married a Hamite. And they were pissed about it. And they were jealous of Moses' position with God. And so they were murmuring and backbiting against Moses together in a secret place. But you know what happened? God heard it. That ought to scare us to death. And the Lord heard it. All right. Numbers 12, 9. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he departed. God bounced on them. Man, if God departs from us, we are dead people. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and remember, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my lord, or my master, my boss, I beseech thee, lay not, this, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. When she was judged, they realized, man, we sinned with our mouth. And because she sinned with her mouth and Aaron sinned with her, his mouth, God cursed them. God put death on her. God took away her pigment. She became leprous, white as snow. She became a cursed woman to the extent that she almost began to look like she was dying. No pigmentation. Here's a little, uh, what they call Easter egg or a bonus. No big pigmentation means a curse. All right. Let's keep moving. We're still dealing with this curse. Remember, Miriam was cursed and Aaron was reprimanded. And Miriam died not too long after that. They didn't get Aaron nor Miriam got the promise. They didn't get the promised land because of their mouth. Aaron sinned later and created, a, he sinned at a previous time and, and built an idol and caused Israel to sin. Miriam blasphemed and God cursed her. Moses interceded. God said she's going to have to bear that curse for a season. Then he took off of her. But at the end result, we're dealing with the, nat with the flesh now. Because of their sin, they didn't get to go into the promised land. They saw it from afar. The flesh ain't going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's all types and shadows. All right. So we can't let our mouth and our flesh put us in a position where God's going to destroy us in the hell fire. And that's what we're talking about. This undisciplined tongue. This undisciplined member. And I'm moved, like I said, to get into this teaching because so many of our people, young and old, are dying and getting eternal damnation or the second death because of their mouth. You hear the truth and you reject it. Oh, brother, you better be careful. God is counting every word. You choose the heathen over the truth. God is counting every word. You blaspheme against the Most High in your mouth. God is counting every word. And that's why this teaching is a fearful teaching for me. It should be for all of us. All right? The undisciplined spirit. This is what we're about to deal with also. An undisciplined mouth. Remember, the dangers of the undisciplined mouth is the end result. That mouth is going to get that soul put to death in eternal damnation. All right? So here we are in Leviticus 24. In Leviticus 24, we're about to hit the meat of this thing. And we're going to look at what's required of us. All right. Through some examples. And these are precepts and examples. 
Leviticus 24.11. And the, Itra and the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Spirit of God and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses. And his mother's name was Shilomith, the daughter of Debri of the tribe of Dan. Now, one thing you got to understand about this woman's son is that he's outside the camp, but he's still allowed to be around the people because his mother was of Dan. He's there, but he had no fear of God in his heart. His daddy was a heathen. His daddy was an Egyptian. All right. So he gets into a confrontation with a pure Hebrew brother. He's a he's he's a what they call uh, mixed. All right. If you want to learn about mixing seed, our brother Deacon Micah did a great teaching a couple weeks ago about the children that mix seed. It's on his channel at OKC, King James Bible University. You can check it out. So here we have a mixed seed about the blaspheme. His mouth going to get him in trouble. The, the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Spirit of God and cursed. He blasphemed and cursed God. And they brought him unto Moses. And his mother's name was Shilomith, the daughter of Debri, of the tribe of Dan. Now we're going to skip down to verse 14. And God told Moses, and this is God's response about the boy. They put the boy in jail and Moses and the elders went to seek what to do with this situation. Because this guy had blasphemed the Most High in Israel. And this is what the Most High said for them to do. Bring forth him that have cursed without the camp. Understand, he's outside because He's not fit because he's he's a he's a he's a mongrel, so to speak. He says, bring forth him that is hath cursed without the camp. So they brought him forth and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head. See, this is what you have to understand, my brother, my sister. Every man or woman in Israel and in this world, when we sin, we're going to have to bear our own sin. That Christian preacher lied to you. Jesus Christ did not bear your sins. You're going to have to pay for your own sins. So you either pay for it like this boy is about to pay for it or you give up your fleshly life and you repent. You remember who you are. You begin to keep the covenant and we begin to follow Christ and we follow and live in the footsteps of the most high through Christ and get salvation. But either way, we're going to have to pay. We're going to have to pay by killing this flesh now or getting eternal separation and damnation. So the price for sin has to be paid. All right, let me continue. So they brought him before the congregation. And they all laid their hands on his head, right? And they took up stones. Verse 15. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. In other words, whosoever curseth the Most High, the Holy One of Israel, you're going to have to bear that sin. And the ways of sin is what? Death. All right. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord. He shall surely be put to death. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He's immutable. So whoever blasphemes God. And curses God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemes the name of the Lord, the name of the Spirit of God, whoever blasphemes the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Christ, he shall surely be put to death. And remember, all flesh going to die. So this death is the second death, that lake of fire. So when this young man died, he, had, he was going to one place, condemnation. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him as well as the stranger. So God says, the, whole, the Hebrew man living in Israel, if you do this, even the stranger, you're a Hamite living with us, hanging out with us, and you start to blaspheme God, you're going to get put to death. 
as well as a stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Spirit of God, shall be put to death. And that death is the second death. The second death. That lake that burneth with fire, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there's separation from the Most High God. All right? I'm going to read something that's not written. I mean, it's not on the slide, but I got to read it. It says in Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed in, and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death have no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now that second death is this. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceiveth them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. They weren't getting the kingdom. And I saw the dead small and great, it don't matter how much money you got, how much fame you got, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And those books are found in Galatians, for example, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Okay? The book of life is the covenant. The books are the works of the flesh. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Shilomith's son because he blasphemed the spirit of the Most High God, the Holy One of Israel, when Israel stoned him and put him to death, and he was judged a blasphemer at that stage in Leviticus 24. Once they put him to death, his soul and his spirit was cast into hell to be later cast into a lake of fire. So my brother, is the flesh and the mouth worth hell? Is running off at the mouth worth eternal damnation? You got to think about it. Young man, young woman, think about it. David said this in Psalms 26, verse 2. He says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. So we got to be willing. God, we got to examine ourselves according to the scriptures. And we got to allow the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ to examine us. And where he needs to cut us, we got to let him cut it. Cut my reins. Cut my spirit, cut that iniquity out of my heart, out of my soul, out of my mouth, out of my mind that I can be saved. And that's what David's prayer was. Also, David says to something to us in Psalms 19, 14. He says, let the words of my mouth, and that's why words are important. Remember, the mouth coincides with the heart. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O oh, Spirit of God, my strength and my Redeemer. Our words have to be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Our heart has to be acceptable. So we got to let God, we got to be willing to put to death our words and our heart and crucify it and nail it to that suffering unto death, which is the cross. And the reason why is this. Let's go to Sirach 23, verse 6. You see what an undisciplined spirit will get you? Shilameth's son is an example of an undisciplined spirit. Blaspheming God. All these hip-hop rappers out here falling, being shot to death in the street. Brothers and sisters being put to death everywhere. 
A lot of that, my brother and sister, is judgment because of an undisciplined spirit. We better be careful. Let's go to Sirach 23, 6 and 7. It says, let not the greediness of the belly, which deals with your lust, nor the lust of the flesh take hold of me. Give not over me thy servant unto an impudent mind. He says, hear, O children of Israel, the discipline of the mouth, he that keepeth it shall never be taken with his, in his lips. In other words, the prayer was, God, keep me from my sin, from the wickedness of my flesh. Help me get out of this flesh, kill this flesh. And then the Spirit of God is saying to us as children, a disciplined mouth, a mouth that speaks righteously, is tied to a heart that speaks righteously, that believes righteously, that thinks righteously. A disciplined mouth will keep a man from being taken or being put to death. Because Shilomith's, uh son had an undisciplined mouth, he died and got the second death. All right? So be careful, my brother. And how to deal with this undisciplined spirit and create a disciplined spirit within us. All right, Sirach 23, verse 8 and 9. The sinner shall be left in his foolishness. Both the evil speaker and the proud shall fall thereby. And that's why so many Israelites are dying daily. So many Hebrews. Let me read that again. Sirach 23, 8. The sinner shall be left in his foolishness. And it's going to describe his foolishness. What is it? His mouth. Both the evil speaker and the proud, they are the sinners, shall fall thereby, by the fruit of them lips. Accustomed not thy mouth to swearing. Break that habit and neither use thyself to the naming of the Holy One. All right? Think about it. I'm going to show you an example. Many of, our, many of our people who are coming out of Christian church and sometimes the Christian church, even though it's bad, we, we learn certain things that we have to be mindful of depending on the background of that church. So in these so quote unquote so called holiness churches, people are taught how to speak on a more pure level, you know, uh, no cussing. You see, cussing shows low level of knowledge. All right, you have to speak on a higher level, intellect. Now, what happens is, many of our people, you weren't a cusser. You was in the church. You find out you're Israel, you start listening to these fools on the street corner. You start listening to these camps on, on the internet. You start listening to these guys, these groups, these one westers, these, these uh, House of Israel folk, these IUICs, these GMSs. And you start listening to how some of them speak. Now, some are better than others, but they're on the street and their mouth is running berserk. They're speaking blasphemous things. They're cursing. They're cussing people out. They're making people kiss their feet. And then we, we, some of us may have first introduction to Israel is hearing that madness. And then long before you know it, as you keep listening to those stupid videos of them dudes on the corner, that same spirit of hatred gets upon you and your mouth starts repeating the same madness they, they, they put out. All right. So we must not accustom our mouth to swearing. We got to discipline this mouth. The mouth on, 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 the, on the Hebrew Mormon, as I call them, going to get him put to death. Just like the mouth on the Christian or the mouth on the Muslim or the mouth on the straight up sinner. Because our mouths show our heart and our heart has to be pure. It's got to be like the heart of Yahawashai. We got to let God work in our heart through his word, by his spirit. Okay, let's move on. Sirach 23 in 10, for as a servant that is continually beaten shall not be without a blue mark, so he that sweareth and nameth God continually shall not be faultless. In other words, a servant that's being beaten, like when we were in chattel slavery, you see them brothers with all those marks on their back, and they took those beatings, and they took that chase, and they took that whip, and some of them kept, they closed their mouth, all right? The, the results of that beating are bruises and stripes. And many of our brothers took many stripes. Paul even took stripes. 
to, to follow Christ. But he didn't let them stripes cause his mouth to get him in trouble with God. It says, so he that sweareth and nameth God continually shall not be faultless. A man that uses much swearing shall be filled with iniquity. In other words, no matter what you're going through, you can't be blaming the spirit of Christ. We're, at, we're in this captivity getting chastened for our sin. We can't be naming God and blaspheming God because of what's going on upon us. We must be asking God to cleanse us and forgive us. And a man that uses much swearing, swearing off base language, evil communications coming from the heart and the mouth, he shall be filled with iniquity. So them dudes on the street, they promising salvation, talking about this, that, and the other, and the third, and, and talking about, that's right, their mouth full of swearing, their heart is filled with iniquity. It says, and the plague shall never depart from his house. So if we practice sin with our lips, God is saying the plague of sin will always be in our house, in our body, in our temple. If he shall offend, his sin shall be upon him. Remember, the scripture says, if any man offend not in word, he's perfect. And we got to be like that man. That man was Yahweh Shai as he walked in the spirit of Christ. If he, if he shall offend, his sin shall be upon him. And if he acknowledge not his sin, remember, we've all been sinning with this mouth. But if we don't acknowledge this sin, God says, he maketh a double offense. And if he swear in vain, he shall not be innocent, but his house shall be full of calamities. So there's so many calamities upon the children of Israel because of the sin of the mouth, the undisciplined mouth the tongue, the weevil, wicked heart that we got to wage war against and destroy it that we might be free. I'm continuing in Sirach 23, verse 12. This is very powerful. There is a word that is clothed about with death. That's why my brother, my sister, brother Fields, I'm talking to you, my friend. That mouth got to be shut down. We got to discipline this mouth, discipline that heart with these precepts. It says there is a word that is clothed about with death. What word is that? Shilomith's son will tell you the words of a blasphemer. He that blasphemed the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven in this life nor the one to come. Okay. There is a word that is clothed with death. Many of our young people, I'm going to keep stressing this, many of black men and women in America are being put to death because of words that they've been speaking, words that they've been meditating on, words that we've been listening to, words that have been coming to our heart through music, through TV, all right? Words that we share with, with, with the homies and with, with sisters and brothers and people on the street. Them very conversations have been leading many to death. It says, there is a word that is clothed with death. God grant that it not be found in the heritage of Jacob. That word of blasphemy, Lord, don't let it be found in Israel. Don't let it be found in our spirit. Because we won't be forgiven of that. For all such things shall be far from the godly. And they shall not wallow in their sin. So if we found having an undisciplined mouth, it's time to get it in check. It's time to put it to, put it to rest and put it to death. And get it right with God. Okay. Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 1 verse 5. For the Holy Spirit of discipline. Will flee deceit. And remove from thoughts. That are without understanding. And will not abide. When unrighteousness cometh in. So with an unrighteous mouth. And an unrighteous tongue. And unrighteous heart. And we keep moving down that path. The Holy Spirit of discipline going to bounce. That spirit that was on Adam before he sinned, when he started moving with the devil, and him and his woman moved with the devil, that spirit called the woman bounced. The spirit of Christ bounced from him, all right? So the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, is a spirit of discipline. And this is showing us what we should do. We must flee deceit. There should be no deceit in us. We should be removed from Thoughts that are without understanding. That means thoughts outside of what thus saith the Lord. I got to I got to get through these scriptures. I got to read them. I'm getting worked up. Wisdom of Solomon. This was the key. Verse 
chapter one, verse six. For wisdom is a loving spirit and will not acquit a blasphemer of his words. For God is witness of his reigns and a true beholder or remember of his heart and a hearer of his tongue. That scripture right there, we need to highlight it. We need to put it in our mind. We need to put it upon our forehead, upon our thoughts. That the wisdom, the spirit of Christ is a loving spirit. And he will not, and that spirit of Christ will not acquit a blasphemer of his words. So we got to make sure we check our words and our thoughts. For God is a witness of his spirit and a true beholder of his heart and a hearer of his tongue. God is looking at the heart, the spirit, the soul, and the tongue. He's beholding the truth behind all of it. Wisdom of Solomon 1.8. Therefore, because God is that, he's the spirit of wisdom, a loving spirit, and he's beholding all these things. It says, therefore, he that speaketh unrighteous things cannot be hid. There's no place to hide. Neither shall vengeance when it punisheth pass by him. We speak unrighteous things, God's going to send vengeance to correct us. That chastisement will come and it won't bypass us. For inquisition, for inquisition shall be made into the counsels of the ungodly. Inquisition is a deep search. All right. For inquisition shall be made into the counsels of the ungodly. Remember, in Psalms 1, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the in, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. All right? These things ought to be ringing in your mind and your spirit. For inquisition shall be made into the counsels of the ungodly. And the sound of his word shall come unto the Lord for the manifestation of his wicked deeds. God's going to examine the counsel of men. If it's found ungodly, he's going to examine the words. And if it's found ungodly, he's going to see and it's going to manifest wicked deeds. And the end result of those wicked deeds will be the destruction of that man. Therefore, my brother, my sister, beware of murmurings. Why did Israel be in the wilderness for 40 years and didn't go into the promise? Didn't get that salvation in that first group? Because of murmuring, the mouth, the tongue, they murmured against God and Moses. God said, you ain't getting the promise. Those who are 20 and under can go in, along with Joshua and Caleb. Those that are 20 and over that came out of Egypt, you're going to die in this wilderness. You ain't getting the promise. Why? All because of the mouth and the heart. Therefore, beware of murmurings, which is unprofitable, and refrain your tongue from backbiting. These are Words of direction and counsel. For there is no word so secret that shall go for naught. Remember, God's watching everything. And the mouth that belieth slayeth the soul. That lying lips is killing souls. Seek not death in the error of your life. And put not on yourself destruction with the works of your hands. So many are seeking death in, when they're in the air of life because of their mouth. And destruction is coming. And therefore, we got to warn our brothers and warn our sisters. And we got to keep warning ourselves. Keep your mouth. Father, put a watch over my tongue, over my heart. All right. Wisdom of Solomon 116. But ungodly men with their works and words call it to them. In other words, there's a word that lead it to death. Okay. And ungodly men with their works, what they're doing and the words they speak, they are calling death unto themselves. All right. For when they thought to have it their friend, you thought being that big mouth hip hop superstar was where it was at. You didn't know you got caught up and you're calling death to your life. For when they thought it to have their friend, they consumed it to not and made a covenant with it. What they make a covenant with? Death. And what death? The second death. Because they are worthy to take part with it. 
So if we stay on this path of an undisciplined mouth and a tongue as a people, the end result is condemnation and death and destruction and hellfire. And this thing has taken out many in Israel. I can't say this enough. That's why I'm making this video. Way too many of us are dying because of an undisciplined mouth. We're about to conclude. At the end of this, there's one thing we have to understand. Solomon told us that the whole duty and purpose of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's it. It's not to be a big shot. It's not to have people laud over you, hold your name up on high. To be worshipped of men. It's not to please the flesh. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. The whole duty of Israel is to fear God, keep his commandments. Now let us hear the conclusion. I'm about to read from the Romans in the New Testament. This is a spiritual law. Okay. It says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Let me read that again. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Who are our members, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our thoughts, our attitude, our bodies, our tongues. Everything that we are, we got to yield it to God. When we live a natural life in sin, we are yielding our mouth to unrighteousness. An undisciplined tongue is an instrument yielded to unrighteousness, which produces sin, which produces death, which leads to the second death, which is hellfire, condemnation. But if we, through the Holy Spirit of discipline, yield our members unto Christ, meaning our spirit, our mind, in our heart, if we can love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our spirit, and our might, and then love our neighbors ourselves, then we will be able to yield our members to righteousness. And we won't be killing one another physically, nor emotionally, nor spiritually. Why should we do this? Understand the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 115, tell us for righteousness is immortal. You want eternal life? You want to be immortal? Immortality is not found in the flesh. It's not found in the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. It's not found in all the things America is selling. It's not found in all the things this carnal world is promoting. Everything that this world promotes, whether no matter what continent you're on, no matter what land you're in, no matter what language you speak, no matter where we are scattered on the planet, all is lust of the flesh and vexation of spirit. This world does not produce immortality. Immortality is only found in righteousness. And what is righteousness? Psalms 119, 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. So righteousness is doing that which is right by the Most High through Christ and is in keeping the commandments and faith that is in Yahawashai our Messiah, okay? And finally, the righteousness of thy testimonies, the word is everlasting. This is a great prayer. The righteousness, Father, of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. So in order to live, we got to put to death this tongue. We got to cleanse this heart and we got to put to death that old wicked heart that's within us. And we have to move from an undisciplined spirit and an undisciplined mouth to a disciplined mouth. Look how much madness was stirred up in America among the heathen. All because people with undisciplined mouths were speaking on Twitter, on the Internet, on the media. National leaders were speaking with undisciplined mouths and they created havoc and hell all summer long. Just think about it. 
Many cities were burned down because of the results of folks who had power operating with undisciplined lips. Now we know the heathen have no place in the covenant, but still, just, this is just a common thing. If you learn how to discipline your mouth, your life will be better. And so I'm signing off with this teaching, and I pray that it be a blessing to you. It shows us how much more work we have to do. We're losing far too many of our mothers, sisters, brothers, sons, daughters in this captivity in the diaspora because of an undisciplined mouth. And we have to, something has to change. And the change starts with each man and each woman. As we bring ourselves under subjection and we put to death the works of the flesh and we pick up our cross and follow Yahweh Shai and follow the spirit of Christ, then we can help our brother and our neighbor go there. So I'm Elder Fields. I'm signing off. I pray that these principles will help you and help me as we strive to enter into life. Remember, his testimonies are everlasting. And if we get the understanding to the precepts and live this thing out the way God has intended for us to do, and if we put to death the deeds of the body, we shall live. God bless and good night. Shalom.